Welcome to chapter eight of this massively open online course. My name is Stefan Shimura from the Helmholtz Center Dresden Rossendorf, where I work as a radio chemist in tracing nanoparticles fate in environmental settings. Here I want to follow up from the previous chapter and illustrate the use of radio tracers in this context using some example studies. As introduced in the previous chapter, we at the Institute of Resource Ecology of the Helmholtz Center Dresden Rossendorf use different radio labeling approaches shown here again to introduce radio labels into nanoparticles for use in environmental fate studies. Using the different methods, we have radio labeled the most common manufactured nanoparticles, such as silver, titania, ceria, carbon nanotubes, and quantum dots. The so labeled particles can be reliably detected without complicated sample preparation in the environmentally relevant concentration range of nanograms per liter, even against high elemental or particle backgrounds. Now I want to present to you two studies on the environmental fate of ceria nanoparticles that will walk you through the study design from radionuclide production, nanoparticle radio labeling, detection to data interpretation that would illustrate how powerful a tool radio labeling can be when used to its full potential. First of all, I want to introduce you to what we call the smart radio labeling of ceria nanoparticles. Smart in the sense that the specifics of the radio labeling process will give a mechanistic insight beyond mere tracer quantification. For the radio labeling of serial nanoparticles, we have access to two options. The first is the in diffusion of the cerium 139 radio tracer, which we produce via proton irradiation of a lanthanum foil, triggering a PN reaction, proton in, neutron out. After production and separation of the radio tracer, we let it diffuse into a dry powder of nanoparticles at 300 degrees Celsius. The second method is the direct activation of the ceria nanopowder. Proton ir irradiation of ceria nanoparticle using a suitable target design at our cyclotron triggers the P2N reaction from serum 140 to praseodymium 139 which decays with a half-life of four hours to cerium-139. So both methods produce cerium-139 radio-labeled nanoparticles that physico-chemically are for all intents and purposes the same. However, the radio label is distributed differently in the two methods. For the in-diffusion method, the radio label will sit more closely to the surface of the nanoparticles while the activation will produce an equally distributed radio label. This leads to a different radio label release upon dissolution of the particles and it enables us to track dissolution phenomena. We have used this to track ceria uptake into plants. If dissolution plays a role on the uptake pathways, we should see a different radio tracer uptake for our two different batches of radio labeled particles. And here's what we get. We see no difference in uptake and translocation between the two batches. Furthermore, using autoradiography, we can localize the translocated particles deposited in the leaf veins and at the edge of the leaves. Additionally, if we wait longer to harvest the plants, we can see a change in this distribution pattern towards an equal distribution of the activity. Consequently, we interpret this as a particulate uptake along the water current with a subsequent dissolution taking place inside the plant. In my next example, I want to show you how we further improved on this smart radio labeling concept by introducing dual labels to combine the two batches of particles into one. With the help of our colleagues at the Josef Stefan Institute, we activated Syria nanoparticle using neutron irradiation at the research reactor in Ljubljana. This way, we produced serum 141 equally distributed inside the particles. On top of this, we did the in diffusion labeling with cyclotron produced serum 139. Going through these processes gives us dual labeled Syria nanoparticles 
with the two radio labels distinguishable by their specific gamma emissions. Now we can track the solution phenomena by tracking the cm 139 to cm 141 ratio in a single experiment. Should we detect an increase of the nuclide ratio of the cerium, the ceria must have gotten where it is via a dissolution-based pathway. We use this to track the ceria nanoparticle uptake by freshwater shrimp. Over a month after ingestion, we track the content of the different radionuclides within the alive shrimps using gamma spectroscopy. As you can see here, initially, the radionuclides are excreted in a similar fashion with every feeding and excretion step being clearly visible as steps in the activity contents, indicating a removal of cereal particles with the digester. However, after 20 days and three feeding steps, the excretion of serum 139 stops, while the serum 139 to serum 141 ratio jumps by an order of magnitude. We interpret this as a near total excretion of the cereal nanoparticles from the shrimp's digestive system, while the remaining activity represents a 0.1 per mil fraction that took a dissolution-based pathway into the inner organs of the shrimp. Using autoradiography, we can localize the remaining activity in the lower cephalothorax of the shrimp, where the hepatopancreas of the shrimp is located. This is the organ responsible for the detoxification of the shrimp's blood. Summarizing from this and the previous chapter, using radio tracer techniques, you can use a variety of different detection modalities to quantify and track the environmental fate of nanoparticles. At minimal concentrations in complex matrices, almost without any sample preparation necessary. Radio tracer availability, radio labeling yields, and radiation protection issues aside, you're only limited by your own creativity. With this, I hope I could share my fascination in using radio tracers for environmental research. And uh, thank you for your attention. For further information, please uh, visit our website and uh, our social media accounts. Thank you.